Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. Uh, tonight, we are continuing the study in the book of Ephesians. We are on chapter 3, beginning with verse 15. Before we get started, let's say hello to the congregation. Sh shall we start with uh, ladies first? To, how about Sister Renee, also known as the untwisted sister. <laughs> Don't crack me up when you say that. Hey there, beloved saints. Uh, I, I'm kind of bummed out I didn't get to do a video, but it looks like we're getting, uh, we've got 20 people here so far, so that's good. Uh, to let my, invite some of the newer viewers in, I was taking a nap. And uh, I didn't make it to my brick and mortar church, so I kind of took a nap and didn't wake up till right before. <laughs> But I'm excited to do the Bible study with you guys tonight. It looks like somebody uh, in the chat room noticed uh, the change, Ben. Ben, say hello to everybody and tell them tell them about the uh, the change that we made. Well, yes, uh, per Luke's request, we made a change to the introduction a little bit to add uh, a reminder or a just a statement. Uh, that we always need to be on guard for the simplicity of the gospel and uh, and fiercely protect that. Um, it's it's the only, it's the the world's greatest treasure. I mean, in, in heaven's greatest treasure. Um, so uh, I think it's important that we uh, remind ourselves and uh, remind the audience that's important that we earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. Um, I'm also happy to be here this evening and looking forward to the study with you guys. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm always uh, happy when I see uh, some new names or even some old names uh, who have been gone but have returned. So uh, welcome everybody in the chat room. And let me ask it to uh, remind the, the moderators, uh, make sure that if someone's new, you you give them a, a greeting. Make, make sure that... Uh, we want them to know that they are welcome. All right, let's get started with this study. Uh, let's look at for verse 15 in the KJV first. It says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit, in the inner man. Sister Renee, 15 and 16. Yeah, I want to remind everybody, uh, a lot of people misunderstand this rebirth and being born again. They think it means that you, you used to be bad and now you're good. You know, and that that's not the rebirth. The rebirth is something that's spiritual. It cannot be seen. And it's how we have our identity in Christ. When Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain, that attitude comes from us understanding that there is no confidence in the flesh. And so we reckon ourselves already dead to sin and to the law. There, there, it doesn't justify us. And we're dead to sin, meaning we're alive to righteousness uh, in that the Holy Spirit guides the inner man in how he should be walking based on who we already are in Christ. See, the religious people tell you have to do these things to become. But God says you have become in Christ. Now do those things. That's, that's a big difference in the message. You're not doing something in order to become like Christ. You are like Christ, so you need to do those things. And so with that being said, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's the spirit man. Because the flesh and blood doesn't inherit the kingdom. It also proves that there's an inner man, like Paul says, these people trying to say that Paul... When he said the good that I would, that I don't, the thing that I hate, that I do, uh, that that was before he got saved. That's ridiculous 
because he still has carnal flesh, just like the rest of us, until he's free from this body of death. And so he talks about the inward man, how he delights in the law of God after the inward man. But there's another law working in his members, and that's the law of sin and death. And so that's going to be the battle. And it's really silly to deny a battle exists. You cannot win a battle that you don't believe exists. So when he mentions the inner man here, I think it's really important to know that that's, that's the real us, the inner man, the new man. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, Brother Ben, what do, you, what do you say about it? 15 and 16. Okay. Um, well, with regard to this verse, uh, pretty simple verses. Um, but so uh, the first verse 15, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. I kind of think that Paul kind of, re again, I think I, Paul's kind of re resuming a prayer that he started in verse one. I think it was verse one in, verse one in this chapter. Um Yes, he started a prayer that he kind of stopped and kind of did a uh, went off on a tangent, uh, kind of. Uh, but now he's circling back around and completing his prayer, I believe. And then 15 is his first verse of this prayer. Um, and I think he's basically recalling what he said previously in Ephesians 1 21, where he said, uh, where he's basically relating that uh, that God the Father created all things through Christ. So I know there's another verse in the Bible, I don't remember exactly where. But it says, you know, all things were created for him and by him. And in Ephesians 121, I think uh, Paul is really kind of revisiting this, this idea that uh, we're, well, Ephesians 121 says, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come. So again, this is keeping with the theme that uh, I think that we saw early in Ephesians where God is reconciling the whole world. Uh, both all things heaven and, and on earth, all things created um, in Christ, and um, and so that's that, I think that's something that we we all understand. Uh, but with regards to the uh, the, the inner man uh, building him up, uh, we know that um, the Holy Spirit is what is is the empowering what empowers believers um, to walk in the light and to be strong in the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the inner man, uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit energizes that inner man, gave birth to that inner man, and uh, it's strengthened by, uh, again, uh, uh, walking after the Spirit, which are, includes uh, abiding in God's Word. Um, we know the inner man is being renewed. That's how we renew the inner man. We renew the mind, whereas the outer man, the physical body, that's decaying. So one's being built up. And these, this, this temporary body, the eternal, the inner man is is eternal. Um, the outer man is temporary, and he's dying. He's getting become more and more corrupt. Um, in fact, it, it says elsewhere in the Bible that the flesh grows corrupt. But uh, and that's that's all an unbeliever has. They're just growing more and more corrupt essentially. Whereas we as believers, we're being renewed, and ultimately we will be glorified uh, when Christ returns. Okay. Thank you. Well, first let me say my apologies to all of the real schizophrenics when I say this. Uh, I, I feel bad for those people who suffer from that condition. But in a way, uh, when we're born again and we become a new creature, and yet we're still stuck in this body of flesh, and there, as Paul says, there's a struggle between the old man and the new man. It's kind of a schizophrenic type of existence um, where we're two people. And uh, there, there was a, some kind of a story uh, I heard years ago talking about this. And they compared it to two dogs, a, a black dog and a white dog. Uh, one was representing good and evil. And which... Which one will will grow and thrive? Well, it's the one you feed. So, if we want the the new man, uh, the 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 new creation, the, the child of God that we are now to to grow, then uh, we need to feed that and, and starve the old man. The old man is 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 fed with carnal things. Uh, uh, the new man is fed with spiritual things: Bible study, fellowship. 
prayer, ministry works. And so if we spend our time doing those things, the new man grows and grows and the old man starves. And it gradually what happens is you end up with uh, a person you can who is obvious to everybody that they there's a real spiritual growth maturity is taking place. Um, now let me talk about these verses here a little bit more. I, I want to read 14, 15, and 16 in the Amplified in, uh, together. It says, "For this reason, that is grasping the greatness of this plan by the Jews and Gentiles are joined together in Christ." I bow my knees in reverence before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, God, the first and ultimate Father. May he grant you out of the riches of his glory to be strengthened and spiritually energized with power through his spirit in your inner self, that is the indwelling your innermost being and personality. Uh, there's a there's a footnote here also in, in the uh, uh, Amplify for verse 15. It says, in Greek, the word for family is patria, which is derived from pater, pater, P-A-T-E-R, the word for father. The concept of family originates with God. Um, that's something to think about. Uh, but uh, on the NABRE, it also has a footnote on verse 14 and 15. It says, every family, that is, in the Greek, there is wordplay on the word for the father, patria, Peter. The phrase could also mean God's whole family. So uh, both of those translations and their footnotes, they felt that uh, this word, Father is uh, there's more to it than meets meets the eye. Uh, all right, uh, Ben or Renee, you want to say anything more about those verses? No, but I'm glad both of y'all mentioned the context. Here's the continuation of uh, Jews and Gentiles being brought under one new man in Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Amen. All right, then let me go back to the KJV. Uh, ben, you can go first on verse 17. It says uh, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So that's through 19, 17, 18, and 19, Ben. Okay. Um, let me see here. So, uh, so the verse that says uh, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, um, studying the word dwell in the Bible, I know it means to be, it means to, well, it means as, as it means in English, but it means to be at home or to settle down or be at, be at home with. So um, we know that Christ, when everyone, when everyone, when anyone believes the uh, Christ permanently lives in all believers uh, through the person of the Holy spirit. Um, but to that, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you, as you continue to believe as you continue to grow in Christ um, and abide in him. He, uh, he makes his home there. Uh, it, it essentially makes a, it, he, he's at home in their lives. He's at home in your life, essentially. So he is a, a constant companion with you. Um, uh, it, it, but again, I, I believe that uh, to get a fuller understanding of that and uh, it, it is for, for the believer is to, uh, again, abide in his word, continue to grow, um, continue to uh, learn. And the, the verbs uh, that say rooted and grounded uh, the Greek uh, I'm reading here is that it's a perfect tense. The the, the be, where it says being rooted and grounded, it's in a perfect tense, which means that it's a past action with an abiding result. So this is something that they've already been rooted, they've already been grounded in God's love. They're saved forever, regardless of their of their uh, behavior or anything else. Uh, it's it's a it's a permanent state. But um, with with respect to uh, understanding the height and the length and the depth, 
Um, the width actually says the width, the length, the depth, and the height. So that's really four dimensions. And the four dimensions, um, that's really, that kind of speaks to the limitless uh, limitless extent of God's love for them. And obviously that we, we see God's love for us in the fact that he would be willing to die for us. And I believe that as we reflect on that uh, daily and uh, meditate on that, really, you know, I, I, it's, I don't think in this lifetime we will ever fully understand it. But as we, we, we do focus on that, on these things, um, where, where Paul says that we would be filled with all the fullness of God, I believe, again, it, the more we reflect on God's love for us, the more we, 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 um, that, um, manifests itself, I believe, or should manifest itself in our, our love for others and, and are the ones who are also begotten by him. And so through that, that's how we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, essentially. God is love. And so the more we love, the more we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, in that respect, I see that's what, what Paul's probably re- alluding to when he says, be filled with all the fullness of God. It's it's to be filled with God's love. Hmm. All right. Thanks. All right, Sister Renee, uh, 17, 18, and 19. Yeah, I, I, I want to confirm the the words by faith here uh because paul is also if we go back to the beginning here uh confirming that uh, circumcision and the law profit nothing and that not just salvation but as he was talking about our ongoing relationship with christ our strength our spiritual growth all of that comes from the same thing by faith it all comes by faith and so um when it says that christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love and i i think here if people would get because i again i got another comment today uh jeremiah says you got to repent of your sins and they they don't get it like they they don't understand what we're saying when we say repentance is to turn from your dead works and trust in Christ. And then once you are saved, you're rooted and grounded in his love. And then the Holy Spirit tells you what your identity is. And so to live is Christ, to die is gain. So our attitude uh, is that. Now, if we remember People back in the first century, the Gentiles, they did not have the scriptures. Um, The synagogues had copies of scrolls of the law and the prophets. They were kept in the synagogues. Uh, But the average Joe Gentile did not have the scripture. What they had was a clear gospel message, the message of what Christ had done. And the stories of Jesus's love and the apostles love done in his name. So what they had to guide them was the spirit and the example of selfless love done by the disciples of Jesus and Jesus himself. That's all they had. That's all they had to uh, guide them. And so the by faith there is really important. Uh, the love there is really important. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So if a person doesn't understand God's love in Christ, if they still think things are conditional upon them, I, I don't know how they can even be a good Christian. Like, I don't know how they can even begin because it's by faith with knowledge of his love and they don't have either. So that's where we see a lot of religion, but not a lot of true uh, Christianity going on. And I I think that's what he's talking about here. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, whenever I see uh, certain words or phrases, uh, the, uh, all of a sudden I, I feel I have to, defend a point um in verse 17 it says that christ may dwell in your hearts 
by faith. Now, there, there's other verses where the word heart is used uh, sometimes to um, um, make the point that this is a sincere, heartfelt belief. That uh, uh, and, and but there's other times where uh, the the word heart in, in, in Jesus where Christ is mentioned and people um, they apply these verses. Maybe they don't even have these verses in mind, but they it's very common today. A vernacular is that I invited Jesus into my heart. Now we know that the gospel is not. Uh, that uh, we invite Jesus into our heart uh, to get saved. Uh, even understanding what that means uh, could confuse a lot of people. I mean, after all, what is your what is a heart? We we know that a heart is actually an organ. That uh, most people agree that the heart pumps your blood through your body. Uh, even though recently I've seen some teaching that the heart's not actually a pump. I don't know what to think of that, but uh, the, that's another subject. The um, uh, the idea that um, um, we get saved by having Jesus come into our heart or inviting him into our heart is something that we want to make sure that people understand that this is not the gospel. However, I think it's wrong to, um, to um, overreact and say that uh, if a person invited Jesus into their heart, that uh, that proves that they never got saved. Uh, even though I would concede that, well, that's not the gospel, but just because someone uh, says, uh, well, I said a prayer and I asked Jesus to come into my heart and uh, uh, all the things that uh, we say, well, that's not the gospel. Uh, the gospel is not saying a prayer or asking for salvation or, and, going forward uh, publicly and, and doing an altar call. Uh, this is not how we get saved. We get saved by believing. But by doing all those other things, including asking Jesus to come into your heart, th these do not cancel out your belief, if you believe. So um, uh, on one hand, we want to be clear that uh, the gospel is not invite Jesus into your heart. Uh, the gospel is believe that Jesus is your savior. He paid for your sins. He promised you eternal life that you're going to go to heaven because of what he's done and his promise. It's that simple. Um, but because the person uses the, the, the vernacular that uh, invited Jesus into my heart, that does not mean that they never believed. And that's why some people are leaping. They're making a leap coming to a conclusion that is really uh, unfortunate. Um, let me read these 17, 18, 19 in the Amplified, because all I did so far was mention that very first phrase, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. So the idea that Jesus dwelling in your heart, this is not a falsehood. I mean, a person could, could argue also, well, when you invite Jesus into your heart, that's not biblical. Well, it really is. There's There's more than one reference like this one talking about uh, Christ being in your heart. Uh, so it is biblical. It's just that it's not the gospel. Um, all right, verse 17, 18, 19 in the Amplified reads, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through your faith. And may you, having been deeply rooted and securely grounded in love, be fully capable of comprehending with all the saints, that is God's people, the width and length and height and depth of his love, fully experiencing that amazing, endless love. And uh, let me see, 19 says, and that you may come to know practically through personal experience, the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that you may be filled up throughout your being to all the fullness of God, so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your lives, completely filled and flooded with God himself. So, uh, Ben, you, you talked about this uh, being filled as being uh, 
I don't remember exactly the, the point you made, but the, the the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit is um, um, it's important. People realize that before the death, burial, and resurrection, before Pentecost, that um, believers were were not indwelled with the Spirit of God. However, uh, prophets and uh, dis, uh, disciples of Jesus they were empowered by God. They were filled with the Spirit of God temporarily so that God could work through them and perform miracles and uh, um, do great things. Um, yeah, it was described as a mantle, something on them. What is, you said? Like, like the Old Testament prophets, they had a mantle. It was like a something they carried. Like the Holy Spirit. That's why David said, take not your Holy Spirit from me. He could come and go. Mm -hmm. It seemed like they, it was, the Holy Spirit was put upon them with a purpose. All right. Interesting. So, so we, we have the, the Spirit of God that has um, entered us. That's the baptism of the Spirit when we believe. And then the continuous uh, living of the Spirit of God in us is called the indwelling of the Spirit. And then we have this uh, filling of the Spirit. Even though a person is born again and indwelled with the Spirit of God, we can also be filled with the Spirit. That just means that, and it's we can pray for this, we can ask, Lord, fill us with your Spirit. It just means give us the power. God, work through us. Use your Spirit to work through me. And uh, it's like uh, uh, charging your, your battery to, uh, to do a ministry works. All right, uh, Ben and Renee, want to say anything more about those three verses? Okay. What's going on in the chat room? Anything uh, interesting in there? I was just looking at what Hendrix and uh, Kevin were saying about inviting him into your heart and stuff. And uh, Chris Annie was saying, you know, God knows our hearts uh, on these issues. And again, I agree, we shouldn't get legalistic about, but it is not the gospel. That is not the gospel, but it is the result of the gospel that he comes to dwell within us uh, once we believe the gospel. But uh, Hendrix was uh, amplifying what Kevin had said. Kevin said, we need a new heart. <laughs> Why would he come and indwell in the old wicked one? He has to give us a new one and then he comes in and dwells in it. And, that, you know, that makes sense. I mean. It's not it's not literal, but God uses these terms, you know, in a way that we can understand. I'll put in you a new heart. We obviously know there's not a literal new thing. It's a new core of our being that drives us. It's something different than what the world, what we had in the world before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. All right. Let me go on and, and read further. Uh, verse uh, 20 in the KJV. I'll, I'll read 20 and 21 together already. Uh, it says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. I, I love that worketh in us. Uh, people forget that if we don't do it, no one will, because we're here to serve the purpose of the church of Jesus. Uh, now to him that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And uh, Ben had brought up earlier that this is uh, the perfect tense means it was something done in the past as the continuing consequence now and in the future. Unto him be glory in the church by Jesus, through Jesus Christ, throughout all ages, world without end. I, I love the, the words there, the wording there. World without end. Amen. It's just saying, you know, like his kingdom goes on forever. It's without end. We see that in the book of Daniel, you know, and his kingdom shall have no end. 
But what seems uh, important here is according to the power that worketh in us. Uh, we forget that um, this isn't just spiritual to me. Uh, to me, this this means that we are to serve and help others within the body of Christ because it's Christ working in us. And it's his power that gives us that so that there, there really is no boasting. Um, to me, though, this whole section is is summed up in the words by faith. It's all by faith and in the riches of his love. Both of those things are really important to this chapter. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. All right, Brother Ben. Um, well, for, the, for the, these last two verses here uh, in this chapter. Um, I would say they're 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 actually uh, one of my one of my favorite verses um, that has a very personal um, meaning to me. Um, I mean, it's not meant to be personal to me, but necessarily. But uh, I'm just saying that uh, verse twenty it says he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to his power that works in us. Um, I see this uh, uh, like my testimony for this verse is I believed a long time ago. However, um, I struggled with under, I, I was troubled, I should say, or unsettled, I should say, um, by difficult verses that I knew what they couldn't be saying, but I didn't necessarily understand what they were saying. And they troubled me. So there are verses like, you know, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, uh, a lot of the sayings that Jesus said in Matthew, um, uh, the first John, some difficult verses in first John, second Peter, Revelation, Hebrews, and I thought I would never really um, ever uh, be able to conquer these things or uh, understand these verses because even the people I respected the most, um, well, well, actually, one of the first prayers I had when, when I as a new believer, as I prayed to God, you know, send me good teachers because I know there's a lot of false teaching out there, but help me to find good teachers. And I know there's a verse in, in First John that says you don't need anyone to teach you, and. But again, I think that verse is often twisted. It doesn't mean that uh, you, you don't need anyone to, to uh, you shouldn't listen to anyone. You should just read the Bible and let the Holy Spirit direct you. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that I think you can accelerate your reading or your understanding rather by having good teachers. And that's why the whole, that's why we have the church. That's why God created pastors and apostles and teachers and things like that. Um, uh, and I think that verse essentially means first John is that you're not, you're not at the mercy of, uh, of of, uh, of 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 another man, like for example, these false teachers. First John, they, these were uh, Gnostics, uh, uh, Gnostics who were teaching that Christ did not come in the flesh. And the, I think he's basically saying you don't need to listen to those men; uh, they're false teaching. Uh, you are you already have the Holy Spirit. You have the the apostles. Listen to us. Look, abide in the teaching. These Gnostics try to teach you that there's something new, and that's what Gnosticism, Gnosticism is always about. So it's endless learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Um, he's basically don't you don't need to listen to them. You're not at the mercy of their of their new teaching. Um, in fact, that's what he emphasized. First John is that uh, I'm 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 telling you things. I'm repeating to you things that you knew from the beginning. You don't need anything new. There's nothing new. That the old teachings that you heard from the beginning are are all you need to abide in. Um, so again, that verse is often, uh, twisted out of context. And, and so I, I, I did, I, I prayed for good teachers and, uh, that was a prayer that was, uh, uh, answered to me in spades. I mean, I was overwhelmed with good teaching and I, I, I'm still, uh, have some more resources available to me that I want, like books I want to read to better understand certain things. I just haven't had a chance to get, I haven't had a chance to get to them yet, but I, I, you know, I, that's, that's God's grace is overwhelming. Uh, he gave me such good stuff, and it's not a waste of time. I told him, don't he knows not to. I asked him, don't waste my time. Don't, don't let me to fall into rabbit trails that are going to be fruitless. Uh, and he's answered that in spades. But also, too, like these other verses, like I said, these good teachers that I have high respect for and I've learned a ton about. I've learned things above and beyond that that uh, that that I think I understand certain verses that they they understand, but I have a deeper understanding. And I'm not saying there's anything special about me. I'm just saying God knew that this was something that I was desperate to understand. Uh, all I wanted to do was understand his word. And he has responded to that prayer in, like I said, overwhelmingly. Um, I know I'm not pretending I understand all things, but there's certain things I, I, I feel like I have a, a clear grasp on, uh, a really solid, uh, irrefutable 
um, understanding of where I can not only make the positive argument, but I can argue against the, any, any opposition that would say, no, it doesn't mean that. Um, so again, that for me, that's that was exceedingly abundantly above all that I asked. Um, and other things too, like I like for a while, the whole ape man or uh, evolutionary crap bothered me. And God showed me uh, irrefutably beyond a shadow of a doubt that those are absolutely frauds. Uh, they're put on by the occult. And they're not just they're not just misinterpretations. They're actually deliberate deceptions. Um, and again, all that all those kind of things just set my faith through the stratosphere. And then I, once that was about a year ago, and so I thought, okay, well, okay, I, I'm on a good course. I've I got plenty to do. But I, I, there was a piece that I was missing, and the piece I was missing was all of you guys. I didn't have anyone to talk to. I didn't have any fellowship, and I didn't even realize the importance of it. But since I started fellowshipping again, my answers, my prayers with that in that respect have been answered above and beyond all, all that I could ask for. Um, I mean, this this church to me is everything now, and I've learned I'm learning so much from you guys. And so this this verse here means an awful lot to me. And I think that verse 21, where it says, uh, to him be the glory in the church. I believe the church is the instrument that God cho chooses to reveal himself. Um, and so he primarily, obviously, he reveals himself in general revelation. But uh, if you want a, a special revelation of God, you have to get that either from this word and or uh, fellow believers, which are the body uh, and, and his church. So, um I think the church is very, very, uh, very critical. And that that's definitely a piece that I overlooked and uh, neglected for far too long. And I'm glad I've uh, learned better. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, brother. Thank you. Um, I certainly approve and recommend that uh, people do read extra biblical uh, theological books. Uh, and it, I, I was once uh, reading a, a book like that while I was on one of my breaks at work and one of my coworkers who uh, I got to know real, realized he's a believer. Danny Lopez was his name. Uh, I invited Danny to come to my house for my home Bible studies I was doing at the time. And he joined us there, but, uh, but uh, he saw me reading a book that was not the Bible and he got all alarmed and said, Oh, he said, what are you reading? I said, I was told him about it. I think it was Fox's Book of Martyrs or, or something like that. And uh, he was all alarmed. He said, no, just, you should only read the Bible. And don't read books about the Bible, read the Bible. And obviously, um, that is the, the Word of God, and that's what we test all other books by. And there is no substitute, but to say that we should only read the Bible and I told Danny, I said, Danny, uh, you know, when we have our Bible studies at the house, um, do you ever speak? And he said, yeah, of course I speak. I said, do you think I should listen to you when you speak? Or or, or uh, say that, uh, well, it's, your words are not the Bible, so I can't. I shouldn't listen to you. Or, or is it helpful for us to, uh, what does the scripture say, Re reason together? Um so he conceded that. I said, well, then, then what is the difference if if, um, if someone uh, speaks in a conversation about the Bible, we can that's okay. But if they write down those thoughts and publish it in a book, now it's not okay? It's It, uh, it just didn't make any sense. And I don't think I, I changed his mind, but that was the, the point. I, I do think that reading extra biblical writings, there's a lot of value. It depends on who it is, of course. Are they teaching the truth or not? Uh, and everybody's fallible, so I don't think anybody, it, any theologian, pick your favorite one. If you if you read everything they ever wrote or everything they ever said, you'd probably find some things that you would say, well, I think they got that one wrong, because none of us are, are right about everything. But we should be willing to listen, and, and people who have invested uh, an entire lifetime to studying and writing about the Bible, uh, we should not discard it as, as useless uh, be, just because it's not the scriptures. Uh, point one, number one. Uh, number two, I, I noticed in the chat room here, um, I am so happy and impressed with the chat room. It's just getting better and better and better. Uh, they not only does the chat room now tend to focus more on the conversation, the, the, the subject at hand, 
rather than being off topic. It used to be in the chat room, whatever we're studying, the chat room's talking about all kinds of other things that are, that are not relevant. So I'm, I'm happy to see about that change uh, that's come. But um, if you were to just sample any section of comments, uh, it's so impressive. Like right here, I just, I'll just look at this for a second. It says, uh, Amy Grant sa says, uh, do we need to read the Old Testament to believe that God came in the flesh, died, buried, and rose again? Um, Hendricks wrote, um, I just want my language to be as clear and understandable as possible. To believe on Christ is a lot clearer than inviting him into your heart. OUDC says, how this comes is how it comes, provided it is the true gospel. That's the point that I was making, is that uh, just because a person uh, learns about Jesus and what he did, and maybe some of the, the language and terminology is, is not uh, exactly the gospel, it doesn't mean that that nullifies their their uh, their conversion, that they, they didn't truly get saved because they misunderstood some of these uh, verses like, inviting Jesus into my heart. David Conlon says, we are dead in the flesh, but born again by spirit. I hope I got that right. I'd say, David, that um, born again by the spirit, uh, yes, uh, that's correct. I agree. But we are dead in the flesh. Um, now, the problem is we are dead spiritually and must be born again spiritually. Now, regarding the flesh, what happens, uh, we need to mortify the flesh and gradually Starve it. That's the point I made earlier about starve the old man and feed the new man. And if you do that, the sin nature wanes and the, the new man is, is victorious. And that's what people will observe. They'll see the new man uh, and real ambassador for Christ. Chris Aniel says, Michael McGregor, we don't have to be scholars to be Christians. A point that I've been trying to emphasize lately a lot is that a person who doesn't have to study the Bible exhaustively. Uh, matter of fact, you don't even have to own a Bible. Uh, most believers throughout all history never had the privilege of owning their own Bible. Okay, we take it for granted today, but as, as Renee said, uh, really for most of history, um, people would verbally uh, hear a preacher preach a gospel message, and it might be a short one or a long one, but they, that's how they got it. They didn't have a Bible so they could study and scrutinize everything. Uh, uh, Nori says it, it, oh, Renee, think about this. He, he says it is literal, but not physical. I think literal may have been the wrong word, Renee. He's talking about this, um, physical, the heart, uh, when you said that it's not your heart literally, um, yeah, it's not the heart literally in the sense that, uh, um, your, your heart being the organ that's a pump, um, but it is your heart literally in the sense that uh, it's a, a heart also literally means that you're, it's, it's a sincere heartfelt, uh, heartfelt. So I, I don't think that you're wrong, uh, but I don't object to Nori uh, scrutinizing and, and, and making that distinction. Renee, what do you say about that? Yeah, well, uh, Nori understood me even though I didn't word it the way, <laughs> clearly. We still got the gist of what I was saying. The heart is the core of us, uh, not the physical organ, but the, the core of us. Um, but uh, Ben had said something earlier, you know, that some of these uh, versions are on purpose deceptions. And yeah, that's heartbreaking when you find out about it. A lot of it is to prop up Roman Catholic dogma. And I, I believe the enemy is behind it. Now, that is not to say that God can't use a false version to bring someone to salvation because there is some truth in it. And I believe God can use anything. He can use anything or anyone for his purposes. So I won't say somebody can't get saved by it, but I, I can say it will cause confusion if you're trying to get clear sound doctrine from it. Um, and it is deliberate to prop up usually Roman Catholic dogma or religion of some sort. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and it, it is mind blowing when you find that out, that it really is. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's against principalities. These things 
are working in men to keep the truth from being easy to see. But God will make sure you get the truth. If you want the truth, God will make sure you get it. Uh, and Amy asking if we have to understand the, or read the Old Testament. Again, I will say that it's God's will that we be workmen. It says a workman, not ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman. So again, studying scripture is work. Uh, we're not saved by work. You're not saved by the culmination of much knowledge. Uh, Paul talked about not with wisdom of words, let the, lest the cross of Christ become of none effect. So the simple gospel and faith in Jesus and what he's done is all you need for salvation. But once we're saved, we're, we're said in scripture that we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen rightly dividing the word of truth. So it is encouraged and we should be filled with God's word. I, I can't tell you how many times a day a thought will come against Christ or a, a worldly message will come against God's word and a verse will pop up to fight it. It's almost like a weapon that shoots it down. And if I didn't have all that word in my mind to be able to shoot down something that comes against my faith, I don't know what I do. And, and I assume it's why there's so many people shaken and troubled by false teachers and also by everything that is trying to come against your faith. It's why we're told to wear the helmet of salvation, to put on the full armor of God. And part of that is, is being filled with uh, God's word. Mm -hmm. Okay, amen. Um, I didn't yet read the uh, last two verses in the Amplified. So before we move on, let me read the Amplified and see if there's anything else to, to discuss. It says, now to him who is able uh, to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly more than all that we dare to ask or think, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, or dreams, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, I don't have any more comment on it, but I love how, how it was stated. All right. Um, anything more before we move to the next chapter? Because, you know, the next chapter means that the subject is going to be completely changed, right? Hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Thank you. That was a, I was, that was a test to see if you were wrong, 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 Luke, wrong. I was across the room, bro. I couldn't even get to my. <laughs> okay. Any more? Shall we move on to the next uh, chapter? Yep. All right. Next chapter. Chapter four. Verse one in chapter four. Uh, uh, I think it's Ben's turn, isn't it? Um, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Brother Ben? Well, it seems that this sentence here is, uh, Marky, it is, um, I, I believe the uh, people who do, did divide it up, the, this epistle into chapters, did it with some idea of, with some, for, for a reason. Um, and I think, Paul, if this sentence here, he says, I therefore, I think he's kind of transitioning off of, uh, the doctrine that he kind of related to before about all things being reconciled in Christ and how we should under contemplate that and understand the love, the, the love of God uh, and everything that he's done. And now I think he's kind of transitioning into application. So now I talk about our walk. So move from doctrine now to application. Um, so just first one, yes, we should walk worthy of the, of the vocation where with we were called. Um, uh, the a walk a, a walk to me kind of implies uh, maybe it might not be the best term but lifestyle. So how do you how do you live out your life? Um, you know, it obviously we, we are we are supposed to 
live our life, um, well, to serve the Lord and to serve his church as a believer. That's ultimately what, what we're here to do. Um, and uh, we, that's a privilege and we can re earn rewards. And, and, and in fact, it's the way, the way we can escape um, the, the power of sin in, in our lives. If we, if we, again, if we walk after the spirit, if we might set our mind on things of the spirit, we won't set our minds on things of the flesh, which only ultimately bring death. So uh, I don't want to say too much um, before we cover the other rest of the chapter, because the rest of the chapter goes into that. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Thank you. All right, Sister Renee, four verse one. Yeah, uh, it's been saying the words therefore uh, means therefore what? It's a continuing thought uh, of the prior chapter that uh, we are equipped by an abundance of love and power by the spirit himself that lives in us. And so therefore, in addition, uh, he is uh, uh, bringing this back around to Jew and Gentile. There is no more Jew or Gentile. There's just one new man and we're all in Christ by faith. Um, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you walk worthy of the vocation or with your call. Uh, that's where you ended, right, Ben? Just verse one. Yeah, verse one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and we are called, and I, I'd like to say that when you're saved, uh, uh, you are called. And the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. They're irrevocable. He won't call you and then uncall you. So Paul is asking the saints to, like Ben said, walk worthy of it. And to me, the walk is how we're living, how we're loving others how we're living in Christ, because it tells us in other places, if you live in the spirit, let us therefore also walk in the spirit. And I believe the walking there is a practical application. It is um, uh, how we live, how we love others and how we live our lives as an example to others. I was saying earlier for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. And it's sad that so many people that accuse us that really believe the gospel and trust only in what Jesus did, they, they can't know that because it tells us here, we can't even get it until we're aware of the uh, abundance of God's love. We, we can't give others that kind of love until we've experienced it uh, and have an understanding of God's love for us in Christ. So uh, what you'll have is a bunch of religion, uh, a bunch of unsaved, unregenerate religious people. That's what you'll have. But it doesn't mean that we don't believe in walking worthy of the vocation wherewith we were called. Uh, we believe that we're supposed to do that. Uh, and Paul here, when he says prisoner of the Lord, I think it's twofold. I think he's literally a prisoner in Rome. I think we discussed that earlier. When he wrote this letter to the Ephesians, uh, he's he's literally a prisoner in jail, uh, but also that he considers himself a prisoner of Christ, but not in a bad way. Like he he feels that he has no choice but to serve the Lord after what he's done for him, especially since he persecuted the church early on. And that now he sees that it's God's grace that gave him this great ministry to the Gentiles. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, it just thought just came to me is, uh, you know, that Paul uh, continues to um, make these references that um, be belittling and, and uh, really are. Point, pointing out his this horrible failure of his of how he started off trying to destroy the church and the exactly what he did we know that he was there for the killing of Stephen um, I don't know if he supervised it or instigated it uh, it says that he held their coats while they stoned him um, but he, he was certainly on board with this being done. And then, of course, he gets a, a letter authorizing him to be in charge of rounding up these Christians. For, I don't know how many years it went on, but for a while, he that's what he was doing, just 
leading the charge against this new, it was called, it was considered to be a new sect of Judaism. And they wanted to snuff it out. And so how, did he actually, with his own hands, uh, stone people and kill them? Or, or did he just lead th this charge to round them up and imprison them and even execute them? Uh, I don't. I don't think it's clear in the scriptures exactly how far he went with all that, but it seems to me that he never forgave himself. I mean, we know that he's forgiven. Uh, you know, that the Lord already cast that sin as far as the east is from the west, and he will remember it no more. I don't think that that, that verse, though, supports uh, this open theology uh, uh, view about uh, God's not omniscient just because it says he will not remember it anymore. Uh, that's another subject, though. But the point is, God's forgiven him, but I don't know if, if um, Peter uh, Paul ever actually forgave himself for, for that. So I'm going to read verse 1 in the Amplified. It says, So I, the prisoner for the Lord, appeal to you to live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, that is to live a life that exhibits godly character, moral courage, personal integrity, and mature behavior. A life that expresses gratitude to God for your salvation. Um, yeah, I will say amen. And that's the Amplified. Amplified, uh, the uh, the shorter version in uh, the KJV, obviously, there's a lot more words, a lot more uh, details that, that we get from the Amplified. And that's, that's the same thing that when any of us read the KJV and then we amplify or expound our thoughts, that's all the Amplified is doing is that whoever the translators are uh, in the Amplified, it's like the group of us getting together and expounding our thoughts and then writing them down and that's, the, that's our amplification. Uh, and I think in this case, it's a very good uh, way that they expounded on the points. Um, but the idea of being a prisoner, yeah, it is uh, literal in that he is in prison in Rome. This is the considered the first of the prison epistles. Uh, I, I think it's very uh, bad that uh, the dispensationalists that go so far beyond just basic dispensationalism and even beyond hyper dispensationalism where I, hyper dispensationalism to me the distinction is that it's only paul's letters uh the rest of the bible the gospel is not there it's only only with paul paul onlyism is what i would call it uh, but then there's another step too far called ultra dispensationalism and they say not only is the gospel and the Bible not for us apart from Paul's writing, but in ultra dispensationalism, they say even Paul's writing should not be, uh, uh, is not really for the church except for his prison epistles. That's ultra dispensationalism, thinking that church actually began after Paul went to prison in Rome. Um, it's really amazing that people come to these conclusions, but. Uh, there are so-called Bible scholars that, uh, uh, what was the guy's name that, uh, something like Bessinger, um, I'll think of it in a minute, but who is, the, who is one of the main uh, in, initial proponents of ultra-dispensationalism? Uh, does anybody know the name of the guy I'm thinking of? You're the church uh, historian. What's that? You're the church historian. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Okay, I'll think. Of, I've got. I'll look at my notes here real quick. Here. Uh, uh, oh yeah, it's. Uh, hmm. I got a lot of viewers that try to correct me when I use John or something from the Old Testament to prove the gospel. Bullying. So only use Paul's letters. That's written to the Jews. That's the gospel of the kingdom. They they completely go overboard uh, uh, dividing. And then they try to correct me if I use anything other than the epistles of Paul. Yeah. Well, here, here's a note I have in my, my file here. It says, 
Hyper dispensationalism exists in different intensities with E.W. Bullinger from 1837 to 1913, an Anglican clergyman and scholar being the best known early expositor of Acts 28 ultra dispensationalism. Although, now when it says Acts 28 ultra dispensationalism, that's another one word of saying, that's when the church began. Um, I believe the church began in Acts 2 uh, at Pentecost. Some believe it was Paul's conversion, mid-Acts is what they're called. And then this one is near here, the very end, near the end of the book of Acts, that's when the church began, when Paul's prison epistles. Um, all right. Uh, shall we go on or to the next verse? Yeah. Okay. Okay, verse 2. Uh, let me read 2 and 3 together, Renee. It says, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Yeah, I think this is specifically talking about not having division between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. Uh, since that seems to be what he's talking about in the prior couple of chapters, um, that we're supposed to not think of ourselves as Jewish believers versus Gentile believers, but one body in Christ working together, no difference. Um, and it says with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering or patience, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So since there's one spirit that dwells in all of us, there's one new man. There should be no division based on uh, genealogy or former customs or former religions. Um, I, I think that's what he's talking about. And I wanted to mention uh, the patients there. It, I, I imagine it was quite difficult, especially if some of these Jews had come out of Phariseeism or the temple system. This was all quite new for them. And some of them probably, even though, Maybe they had probably been taught that the food laws didn't justify them. Many of them still held to those food laws. And we see that Paul is saying, hey, uh, don't use your liberty to make another person stumble. It's not worth it. If it offends them, don't do it for their sake. And so I think that's what it's talking about here, uh, that everything should always be done uh, with selfless love patience and, and meekness and meekness does not mean self-deprecating it means to have um, a realistic view of oneself I, I think this is in the context of Jew and Gentiles uh, coming together in the spirit of unity mm -hmm. well that's how the book starts off right Ephesians um, all right uh, brother Ben verse two and three Yes. Um, well, uh, Renee said it's very difficult. <laughs> I think it is for, uh, difficult for us uh, to do, to be lowly, gentle, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, uh, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Um, it's difficult for us, but we just read that uh, God's given us the power of his Holy Spirit. And, and it is, it, I know you guys will agree that these are the, the very fruits of the Holy Spirit, which is gentleness, long suffering, love, um, unity, loyalty, faithfulness, all that stuff. Um, and so that's why, uh, and, and I know for, as an early Christian, I definitely struggled to understand what it meant to walk in the Holy Spirit. And I don't, I don't, uh, pretend I've mastered it, but I've definitely gotten better at it. And, uh, it, it, for me, it's really meditating on and reckoning myself dead to sin and alive to God. To me, that means I've, you, you basically deny yourself of what you want to do. Um, and I consider what, what would God do? And, and you, instead of working on law principles, which says, okay, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, like, oh, you did me bad. I'm going to do you back just as bad. Um, the whole, you know, that's, that's the law principle. That's the, that's what the flesh wants to do. Whereas the Holy spirit would say, you know, <laughs> give him the other cheek. Um, 
So again, the, the Holy Spirit seeks after not itself, but uh, for others. And so um, for me, it, it helps to meditate on that and reflect on that daily. Um, Cause it, I don't, I, when I wake up in the morning, I don't default in the spirit. I default in the flesh and it's an active, uh, it's an active mindset to, to seek, to walk after the spirit. Um, and one thing that Renee, you guys said before is that uh, Renee said I meant to follow up on is that, um, you know, you guys said earlier that the gift and calling of God are irrevocable or irrevocable. And uh, you, certainly the, the gifts of God are irrevocable. Um, for example, the gift of eternal life, but also the calling. A lot of people think, oh, well, I'm saved, but you know what? This Christian life is just too hard. I, I can't do it. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and rip, you know, let it rip. And they might say they might reason with themselves. Say, "Oh no, God doesn't have that call on me. I'm not. I'm not uh, called to be um, to 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 deny. You know, to, to deny my fleshly desires and things like that." Uh, au contraire, I mean, the uh, Bible says that God has called called us uh, to to live a holy life. That's part of the calling is to live a holy life, not because of anything we did, because because He loved us, and that part of that calling is He expects us to grow. And he's given us everything we need to grow, the Holy Spirit, his word, et cetera, the church. And um, and so, uh, again, we're all called to live a holy life. And uh, part I think we're getting into that right now with this chapter is that we're learning what that means. Um, really serving each other, not being self-serving. Um, and people do rebel against that. Uh, in fact, I think Second Peter is an illustration of what that looks like, where people will rebel against that and say, no, no, I'm going to, I'm, uh, I've turned from the Holy commandment to live a holy life. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to let myself essentially to be deceived by these false teachers. And I'm going to fall back into lewdness. And the result of that is I think the Bible gives them a parable, uh, a, a proverb rather that says, um, uh, it's a, a pig that, uh, or a, a sow that returns to the mire or a dog that returns with vomit. doesn't mean you're unsaved, but that's, behaviorally you become behaviorally like an animal um you're not like you're not living the divine nature like the holy spirit intends for you to live but you're living into you're living in the beast nature which is our flesh um so again we all have a holy calling and god expects these things of all of us there's no exceptions mm -hmm. amen thank you uh well uh, there's a phrase here in back in verse one that I want to relate to verse two and three. It says that ye walk worthy of the vocation. He's, Paul is beseeching us walk worthy of the vocation. Um, it's kind of a tricky thing uh, in a congregation. On one hand, we're preaching that we're saved by grace alone through faith alone, in Christ alone, that our works, that is, you know, how we're living our life, uh, this is, will not determine if, we, if we're saved or not. Uh, on the other hand, we see that we're told to walk worthy of our vocation. Um, is there a contradiction? Uh, no, because to get saved, and our, the question of salvation is, does not hinge upon how well we behave. Uh, one of our truism is salvation is believing, not behaving. Uh, so we simply believe to get the Holy Spirit to be spiritually brought to life, to be born again as a child of God. And then after that, though, uh, how will we walk? In other words, now that we're born again, from that point forward till our last breath, that's our walk. And there is, uh, Paul is beseeching us to do this walk, to live our lives uh, in a way that it is um, worthy. And so what is worthy, I'm going to read two and three in the Amplified. It says, with all humility, forsaking self-righteousness and gentleness, maintaining self-control, with patience, bearing with one another uh, in unselfish love, make every effort to keep the oneness of the spirit in the bond of peace, uh, each individual working together to make the whole successful. 
Um, so if we're going to walk worthy of our vocation as ambassadors for Christ, because when it says our vocation, what is our vocation? Uh, we're ambassadors. We're representatives of Christ. We're, we're Christians, not only in the respect that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. That's our standing before God. That's our uh, description of who we are. Uh, and yet, um, in addition to that, we have the idea of, of um, um, being a, a Christian as a representative of Christ. And unfortunately, um, I've, I've had to part company with some people uh, in the past because they don't take their, um, their role as an ambassador seriously. They're an embarrassment to the church. And it's, it's, it's hard for me to judge other people's lives, uh, even though I'm not judging their salvation, we are called to judge their lives, their walk, their ministry. And, and uh, there are, there's a lot of things where there are grounds for disciplinary action in the church. And I, I've said before, I personally, am, it's hard for me to, you know, lay down, lay it all down and, and draw a line and say there's, uh, there's necessary for discipline in this case, whether you have to be removed from the congregation for a while. Uh, however, this discipline uh, plays out, sometimes there is a need for it. And uh, so these are the qualities that we, um, we should be displaying to the world as an ambassador for Christ. So we do not embarrass Christ or embarrass the, the church. One other thing is this idea of long suffering. It means patience. But so I think long suffering is a really for me personally, being patient is suffering. <laughs> I'm, really, I told you before that I used to. I, I was criticized by my wife and some, my son and my, my friends, and I was really actually quite surprised that not not one or two, but n numerous people would say to me, "You don't have any patience," and I always considered myself to be quite patient. But apparently others didn't see me that way. So it made me have to reevaluate myself. Uh, and I started praying, Lord, make me patient. But it didn't take me long to change my mind and stop praying for it because I realized that for me to gain patience, I would probably have to go through some kind of difficulties in, in order to hone the patience. I'd have to suffer. There would have to be long suffering in order to develop this virtue of patience. And I said, oh, I don't, I don't want to, to suffer in order to gain the patience. Um, that's, uh, so to me, long suffering is a really very descriptive, a real uh, correct way of understanding what patience really is, because I do suffer when I'm when I'm required to be patient. <laughs> I don't know. Does anybody, does anybody ever feel that way, or am I over overstating it? I agree. I don't have a lot of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I have, I have, I have long suffering towards believers, but I don't have a lot, lot of patience towards unbelievers, uh, and that's that's a flaw, and that's something I need to work on. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Any more, Renee? Before we move on. No. Okay. All right. Let's go to verse four. I'm going to read four, five, and six together. It says, uh, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. I think it is it Ben's turn? Or not? Sure. Okay, go ahead, Ben. Four, five, and six. Okay. Um, let me pull up my. Okay. Um, so, well, again, I think it's just, it's just talking about the unity here. Um, what walking in unity, we should all seek to, um, you know, not not we, we, uh, selfishness brings diversity. Because you're all you're, you're you all you're all you everyone has their own selfish desires, which are not um, uh, 
typically uh, they're, they're selfish desires. They're not church desires. And so walking in unity is walking um, it, with consideration in, or in, and in light of, of who we are in Christ and that we're all one person in Christ, essentially. Um, we're all in one body. We're all, there's one, one spirit, one baptism, one faith, uh, one Lord, um, and even one hope. And I think the hope he's referring to there is, is probably referring to the, uh, the the hope of eternal life that and, and it, like you said Luke before too that hope in the Bible doesn't mean uh, um, a, a probability or um, uh, an attitude really it's 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 a um, I'm trying to think of a better word for it it's a, it's a certainty but it's it's an anticipation of a certainty I would yep, say a sure promise yep. yes well said and so uh, again all these things that should motivate us you know the, the, the having an eternal perspective should motivate us um, and, and empower us to uh, again, seek, seek one. There, there's not, you know, the only time there's ever should be ever, ever really any division in the church is, is when there's false doctrine or there's a, a grievous sin, a grievous unrepentant sin where someone will with, you know, it refuses to see their sin or, and or refuses to change. Then yes, in that case we need to, um, there's church discipline, but the, even then, it should we should always uh, hold out hope and um, and seek to bring that unity, restore that unity again. So even even through discipline, even through dividing a false doctrine, um, you know, it's not like it's a permanent uh, uh, division. It, it, we should we should seek to, to, to for reconciliation and restoration if it's possible. If, if people are willing to change, but um, yeah, but there, you know, there's one gospel, one body, uh, one baptism, one faith. Um, we should all be after and thinking of in the same way um, and, and have the same goals essentially uh, for each other and the church. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sister Renee. Yeah, he, he's absolutely right. This is referring to the unity uh, continuing. There is one body, one spirit, not two. And, and, and sadly, that is being taught in many churches, that there's the Jews and then there's the church. There's two covenant people. There's, But the Israel God talks about is the remnant of believing Jews. And then the Gentiles grafted onto that. And then the believe the Jews that are in unbelief, if they'll believe, will be grafted back in. So um, there's one, one body, one spirit, and even as you're called in one hope of your calling, as he mentioned, it's a sure hope. It's a, a promise of God. It's a certain uh, certain thing we're going to receive in the future. That's a hope biblically. Um, one Lord, one faith, one baptism everyone who was baptized into christ was baptized by the holy spirit into christ um water baptism is a picture of that um otherwise there'd be two baptisms right the water baptism cannot possibly be what baptizes you uh, in christ. awesome or there'd be two <laughs> baptism one baptism into Christ, and that's the Holy Spirit baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through and through all and in you all, again, uh, both Jew and Gentile. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this portion of scripture is, uh, you know, very beautiful. A lot of uh, important points being made in, in these verses. Uh, I'm going to read 4, 5, and 6 in the Amplified. It says, there is one body of believers and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you called or were called to salvation, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all who is sovereign over all and working through all and living in all. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Verse six. Uh, I, I think that uh, the, this it is an important word here in the KJV when it says uh, at the end of verse six, uh, and in you all, um, 
you all mean is referring to the group that he's writing to, which is the church, uh, because he, he is not living in all humanity. And I think in the KJV, when it says uh, through all and living in all, uh, I, I do think it is important to make this distinction that that, that Christ, the Holy Spirit, God, God is, is living in all of us believers, but not living in all of humanity. Uh, that only happens through through faith when we get the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, the um, there's a footnote here in the uh, NABRE for verse four verses four through six. It says the quote seven unities unquote uh, church spirit hope Lord faith baptism one God uh, I've never heard the term seven unities before but apparently that's a term for this portion of scripture here these seven things says so it reflects the the triune structure of later creeds in reverse well i'd have to look at the creeds and see i i have a playlist titled uh, early church creed or examining church creeds that i encourage everybody to to uh, look at listen to it because the, the 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 first one that's not really in the in the um, as well uh, known today is I mean it's simple and it's common in Roman Catholicism is called the Apostles Creed I guess that's the oldest one even though they actually consider um, it, uh, Ephesians um, uh, I mean sorry First Corinthians fifteen one through four that that portion of scripture was uh, considered to be a creed. Uh, it was repeated uh, as a creed. So maybe that was the original creed, then you had the Apostles' Creed, then the Nicene Creed, the Revised Nicene Creed, the uh, the Ath Athanasian Creed, and uh, each creed built upon the previous one, but they were mainly to define the Godhead, the triunity of the Godhead, and they did an excellent job the early in early church history, the first few centuries, where they, the church fathers, the so-called church fathers failed, was uh, departing from the simplicity of the gospel. Uh, but what they did well was defining the Godhead. Um, I don't remember where I was going with all that. Um, all right, I guess... Uh, I can't believe the time has flown by so much. It's 7.56. Wow. Did it fly by for you guys, or, or was it just me? Flew by. Wow. That's amazing. Um, I don't remember why I was talking about... Uh, or, oh, yeah, because the reference in the footnote to uh, these verses uh, 4 through 6 as... Uh, um, later creeds it says in the footnote here reflect the triune structure of later creeds i don't remember any triune structure of these creeds but uh you know it's been quite a while since i did those studies on the creeds um all right i guess uh this is where we need to stop for today uh oh here's something funny that uh chris annie l wrote she said i accidentally prayed for patience so god gave me four boys <laughs> okay see what happens see what happens when you pray for patience be careful with that okay um all right i guess uh we'll uh, pick up next time with uh, verse seven so let's start giving our, our our closing remarks here start off with um brother ben uh what did you think of the study today brother I enjoyed the study. Um, I think we're really getting into the beat, of the, the beat of the epistle. Looking forward to that. In fact, um, I made a connection, just reading a couple sentences for, further, um, that I had not made before, and it, it ties in directly. I think it kind of seals the deal for me with respect to my interpretation of uh, Second uh, Romans 12 and the measure of faith that, that's spoken of there. I believe this uh, next couple sentences is a parallel and it, uh, it supports my notion that the measure of faith is not 
uh, uh, it's, a, it's a measure in the faith and the measure is a, a, a gift a, that that's the measure a proportion of gift a diverse a, a diverse portion of the gift uh it's not the measure of faith uh they used to refer to but the measure in the faith essentially and i think these next verses uh support that anyways interesting i'm gonna be looking at that closer um and um I but I very much enjoyed the uh, the study tonight. Learned a few things, and again, uh, added to my notes. So I'm always always thankful for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, Sister Renee, what do you have to say about the study tonight? Yeah, well, I mean, every epistle we read encourages the believers to walk in their identity. It's why I don't understand all these stupid accusations against the gospel. You know, I guess the false gospel of repent of your sins is so prevalent that uh, when you say, no, that doesn't save you, that they automatically think you're telling them to sin or okaying sin or something. I don't know. It's just every epistle uh, deals with how a Christian is supposed to live. And it's just it's telling us who we already are in Christ. And again, I think the big difference is. They're telling you to do these things to become uh, Christ-like, and he's telling us you already are in Christ, and therefore do those things. So I think it's a huge difference in the message. But in Ephesians, I I think there was division because of the Jews and the Gentiles, because Jews had considered Gentiles unclean, and it was very difficult for Paul to get them to come together and see themselves as one, not above one another but working together one in Christ. Um, and I imagine that was really difficult for them, uh, it, it, especially in the Jewish mindset. I mean, honestly, they were considered unclean. You could not fellowship or enter into their home or eat with them. Uh, so I think the lowliness, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, even as you are called in the hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Uh, that is all confirming that we are one. And I, I am horrified to see there's, I think, 40,000 denominations in this country. It's like everybody has their own little pet verses that they separate with, you know, but before the Bible came out, we saw the first century church. Now they had their issues and it was mostly had to do with being Jew and Gentile uh, and issues with paganism and idolatry and stuff like that. But you didn't see division based on scripture until scripture became prevalent. You know? Uh, it's great that we have God's word, but it also allowed people to divide over it. And uh, sadly, I, I don't believe a lot of these denominations are actually in Christ. Uh, I just don't because they have another gospel. You're only in Christ by faith. That's it. You're either trusting what he did, gave you eternal life, or you are not. So there's a lot of professors out there. And I think that the Great Commission of the Gospel is very important right now. Uh, I think it's needed uh, in this climate of fear, for one. And also because there's so many religious people that are lost. Um, and so it's really important we keep doing this and remembering what Ephesians tells us. That there's one body, one faith. Uh, we need to be one in Christ. And uh, Luke was talking earlier. We, we don't divide over non-essentials. You could read uh, somebody that you think is a great man of God and still find something you're going to disagree with. I know I disagree with a lot of people and I know a lot of people disagree with me on some um, non-gospel issues. Uh, and, and when discussing these things, we should hope to reason together and come to like mind. But if we can't come to like mind, we should be kind to one another and at least hear each other out. And uh, I think the whole point of Ephesians is that we're one. We're one in Christ. Amen. Um, well, um, I, I'm sure everybody understands what Paul meant when he says 
there is one body and one spirit, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the, the, the fact is that's technically not true. There's there's more than one body. There is the uh, that's why I would think that uh, it'd be better to, to have this word true inserted in there. I would say there is one true body uh, and, and one true spirit and, and, and so on. Uh, one true Lord, one true faith, one true baptism, uh, because uh, there really is more than one uh, faith. Uh, there, there's one true faith, and then there's many other versions that have perverted it into something else that's, as Paul says, it's, it's another gospel, which is not another. It's a false gospel. So even though it says there's one body, that we should understand that to mean that there's one true body of believers. Uh, there's one spirit, the Holy Spirit, even though some people are operating by a different spirit. Who knows what spirit that is? Um, one Lord? Well, yeah, there's one true Lord, Jesus, Jesus Christ, but... Uh, there's many people who believe in a different Jesus than, than, than the Jesus of the Bible. Uh, either uh, he's uh, merely a prophet, as the um, Muslims say, uh, or he's one of millions of gods, uh, the way that the Mormons say, uh, or he's just a very advanced uh, guru, like the Buddhists or the New Agers would say. Uh, so uh, this idea of being one Lord is one who Lord, the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ. So this, uh, it is all true what he's saying here, but I think we need to understand that uh, it's not, it, it's settled in our mind, all these things, but the people who have are not part of this true faith, biblical Christianity, then uh, there's not one Lord. There's They have a different version of the Lord. They have a different version of the faith. Uh, the one baptism, yeah, there's, there's a water baptism, but this is referring to there's one real baptism, one true baptism that we all have as believers. That's the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When we believe, the Spirit comes in and brings our spirit to life. Um, yeah, we didn't cover a lot of ground tonight, but it was very interesting. And uh, again, I just want to say that the, the chat room's participation is I, I'm, I'm really getting it. A great uh, uh, satisfaction out of seeing the chat room. What's uh, what's going on in there? It's just getting better and better, isn't it? Don't you think so? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. This is Wednesday. Um, uh, Re Renee, any any news on uh, when you'll pick up your Thursday program or another program again? You still uh, need some more time. I'm gonna write. I'm writing Gary Wayne to see when he can do it. I'm gonna kick it off with him. Gary Wayne, I don't know who he is. Genesis 6. Oh. Yeah, he's the author of the Genesis 6 conspiracy. Renee uh, interviewed him already. Very oh. interesting. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, so uh, is there a possibility tomorrow night, or should we look for next week? No, not tomorrow. I'm, I'm dealing with my car and a bunch of mess right now. So. Okay. okay. All right, so the next uh, program... Uh, it will be Friday. Uh, join us here on the same channel, uh, CES, Church of the Eternally Secure, at 9.30 Eastern Time for the Fun Fellowship Friday Night. And if you haven't been with us on a Friday night, come and check it out because we, we call it Fun Friday Night for a reason. It's so much fun, you might even get giddy. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Renee and Ben, uh, and uh, also thanks to the whole congregation, to the chat room, and anybody who watches the upload. Thank you for participating. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.